Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. Today is episode 19 of The Conspirators, which will be part one of the story of the only Lincoln assassination conspirator who was not a Lincoln assassination conspirator. That's just an attention-getting way of saying that Edmund Spangler was the only one of the eight defendants in the assassination trial who was not convicted of conspiracy to murder President Lincoln. He was, however, convicted of something and sent to prison. I would like to demonstrate my belief that he was innocent of all the charges against him and unfairly convicted and punished. He was mostly guilty of being John Wilkes Booth's devoted acolyte. Ned Spangler was a stagehand at Ford's Theater. He had worked as a carpenter on the country home that Junius Booth Sr. built near Baltimore in the early 1850s and had befriended the teenage John Wilkes. Ten or so years later, they became reacquainted at Ford's Theater with Booth now being the dashing star of the stage and Spangler its less dashing scene pusher. This is a fairly literal term. Lightweight pine and muslin flats with painted backdrops were pushed together from the wings by grooves in the stage floor for each scene. It's not exactly a taxing duty, but it is vital in a play's staging and understanding it is important to understanding Edmund Spangler's role in this story. Once Spangler and Booth resumed their friendship, they interacted in ways that seemed completely in character for both. Booth was known to be approachable and generous to working class types, and Spangler was considered good-natured and accommodating. In the fall of 1864, Booth told Spangler that he was going to rent a shed behind Ford's Theater, and wanted to renovate it into a stable to keep saddle horses there. Spangler agreed to do the carpentry, and once Booth began stabling horses there, both Spangler and Joseph Peanuts, or Peanut John Burroughs, a theater errand boy known for selling peanuts to patrons, fed and cared for the beasts. For his part, Booth frequently stood Spangler to drinks. Ned's fondness for alcohol was well attested at the trial, and they were often seen in company together. On Friday, April 14th, the theater bustled with activity in preparation for the presentation of Our American Cousin. Spangler, however, found time to take a nap in the scene shop. After a rehearsal that ended around 2 p.m., he was awakened by Peanut John, who was sent to take him and Jake Rittersbach to boxes seven and eight so that they could remove the partition between the two thus accommodating the full presidential party. It was still assumed at this point that General and Mrs. Grant would be the guests of the Lincolns. Peanuts testified that while there, Spangler remarked, damn the president and General Grant. Burroughs asked him, what are you damning the man for, a man that has never done any harm to you? Spangler told him that he ought to be cursed for getting so many men killed. After finishing with the partition, Spangler and Rittersbach returned to the stage to work on scenery flats. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge another book that this study drove me to read. It's a 2013 publication called Backstage at the Lincoln Assassination by Thomas Bogar, and it traces the lives of the 46 actors, managers, and stagehands who worked at Ford's Theater the night of the assassination. Bogar rather uncritically accepts Spangler's guilt, so we disagree on that point, but his research is invaluable and his book is fascinating. Bogar demonstrates that the political sentiments of the employees and actors at Ford's were split between Union and Confederate sympathies. The theater was thus a microcosm of Washington, a decidedly southern city before the war, whose population ballooned with Union-leading soldiers, government workers, freed slaves, hospital and factory workers, and opportunists as the conflict dragged on. While a rash word in the wrong place might cost Southern sympathizers their jobs or even land them in jail, it was possible to maintain an uneasy truce at Ford's. 
Booth's act shattered the truce, and in a company where everyone was immediately under suspicion of conspiring to assassinate the president, unionists would be strongly tempted to denounce disunionists in order to deflect attention from themselves. Wilkes Booth sauntered up to the Ford's Theater entrance around noon on the 14th, ostensibly to collect his mail. Manager Harry Ford, owner John's brother, mentioned that the Lincolns and the Grants would be in attendance at the play that night. Booth gave no discernible reaction. He sat down on the step and read a long letter from a female admirer, pausing occasionally to laugh at passages in it. According to Lewis Weichmann, Booth was at the Surratt boarding house at 2.30 when Weichmann got home from work. Government employees got half a day off for Good Friday. Then various accounts have Booth spending much of the afternoon in the vicinity of the theater, talking to employees, showing off his recently rented horse, and buying drinks for whomever was around at both the Star Saloon, the bar on the south side of the theater, and the Greenback Saloon, the bar on the north side of the theater. Spangler was apparently with him for much of this time. Evidence indicated that sometime that day, someone mortised a niche in the wall of the vestibule to boxes seven and eight so that a sawed-off piece of pine music stand could be wedged between the wall and the outer door, preventing entrance. There was also a small hole about a quarter of an inch across, apparently drilled by a gimlet through the door to box seven which would have given a peeper a view to the back of President Lincoln's rocking chair. Were these alterations performed by Booth? That's the generally accepted conclusion. He continued to lurk around the area through the afternoon and evening, and a gimlet was found later in his trunk. Then came the play, then the shooting. One can only imagine the shock felt by all present. I still remember the sense of unreality I felt in 1963, sitting in my sixth grade class when we suddenly heard a radio crackling over the intercom telling us the president had been shot. Vicki Sayer turned to me with wide eyes and said, our president? To actually be in Ford's theater, to hear the shot, to see the theatrical escape of the assassin, to be flooded with the enormity of the act, the initial stunned disbelief must have hit like a sledgehammer. But in the next instant, to realize the implications of being a theater employee, or of knowing, if only enough to exchange polite bows, the self-proclaimed murderer, my throat would clamp shut, my brain would lock, my intestines would turn to water. Bogar shows that some people kept their presence of mind better than others but even the most cool-headed, dispassionate observer, if such a person existed in that bedlam, would be predisposed to interpret the images and sensations of that night in a manner based on experience, state of mind, prejudices, and character, which is to say that no two recollections would be exactly the same. And these recollections and interpretations would be very important to the fate of Edmund Spangler. After the shooting, Everyone working at the theater was questioned some multiple times, and some were detained at the old Capitol prison or its Carroll Annex for greater or lesser stints, but only Spangler was charged. After two or three visits to the police station for questioning, he was finally arrested Monday night, April 17th, and roughly trundled off to the Carroll Annex. He was placed in solitary confinement and locked in irons. Thus began an extended nightmare existence for Ned Spangler. He spent five days at the annex, occasionally called for questioning or for identification purposes. And then he was charged as an accomplice to the crime and sent to the Saugus. He was clamped into the sadistic lily irons and was soon introduced to the tight, stifling canvas hood. A week later, on April 29th, he was gathered up with fellow ironclad prisoners Davy Harold, Lewis Powell, Michael Lachlan, Sam Arnold, and Joao Celestino. Remember the unlucky Portuguese sea captain? Never mind, he won't be on the test. In a midnight downpour, they were boated downriver to the old penitentiary on the grounds of the old arsenal. The eight defendants' first sight of each other was their first day in court, May 10th. The hoods were mercifully removed as long as they were in the courtroom. 
but back on they went as soon as the prisoners returned to their cells. They weren't permanently removed until June 6th, after approximately six weeks of that particular species of torture. Other ill effects of the incarceration continued, however, and took their toll on Ned Spangler. In his daily report to General Hancock on June 18th, Prison Commandant General John Hartranft expressed concern. The prisoner Spangler, he wrote, showed indications yesterday that his mind was wandering. I sent for Dr. Porter, the medical inspector, who advised that he be taken into the open air. Hartranft consequently let Ned take the air for an hour in the prison yard. He also called Hancock's attention to Dr. Porter's recommendation that each of the prisoners be taken into the open air once a day and that they should be supplied with reading matter. This and further requests were granted, that the prisoners be given boxes to sit on while reading by their cell doors, maybe the light was better there, and that a chew of tobacco be given to those who use it after each meal. So the fact that Ned Spangler was starting to lose his mind in solitary ended up benefiting all of the defendants. Meanwhile, the trial proceeded swiftly, though not fast enough to suit Secretary of War Stanton. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, wrote in his diary, the trial of the assassins is not so promptly carried into effect as Stanton declared it should be. He said it was his intention the criminals should be tried and executed before President Lincoln was buried. Lincoln was buried on May 4th. The trial began on May 8th. The trial testimony of Jacob Rittersbach was particularly threatening to Spangler. Rittersbach was a German immigrant and a Union Army veteran who had worked at Ford's Theater for just three weeks by the time of the assassination, but he knew Spangler fairly well. They had eaten together at a nearby boarding house for the past year and a half. As Rittersbach explained it to Judge Advocate General Holt, their opposing beliefs on the war led to frequent quarrels, with Ned prone to calling Jake a Negro lover, except he didn't say Negro, especially when he was drunk. This should be understood in light of Rittersbach's allegations about Spangler in the immediate aftermath of the shooting. Both Spangler and Rittersbach were backstage when Booth ran diagonally across the stage, down the stage right passageway, and out the back door. Later that night and the next day, Rittersbach complained to others in the company about being struck by Spangler. He said that after Booth's exit, he had exclaimed, I know who that was, it was Booth, upon which Ned fetched him a slap across the mouth with the back of his hand, saying, Hush up, you know nothing about it. It may be Mr. Booth, it may be someone else. Hmm. We know for certain that Spangler was friends with Booth, and we can suppose that in the shock of the moment, Spangler might have reacted abruptly in defense of his friend. We might ask, under which circumstance was he more likely to respond so, as a secret accomplice or as a surprised innocent friend? But there's more to this detail. When he testified in court, Rittersbach claimed that Spangler said, shut up, don't say which way he went. This much more strongly suggests complicity on Spangler's part. The problem with it is that those who testified to hearing Rittersbach's complaint immediately after the event all said that he didn't say that. He said something more like, hush up, you know nothing about it. Some people later claimed that Rittersbach was frightened by the authorities into tailoring his words to meet the needs of the prosecutors. Another serious charge was laid at Ned's feet. Numerous witnesses related that after the play had begun, Booth rode up to the back of the theater and called out Ned three or four times. When Ned was finally summoned from his backstage duties, Booth asked him to hold his horse, the one that didn't like being tied up. Ned reluctantly took the reins but asserted that he must get back to his scene pushing without which the play could not go forward. He then prevailed upon Peanut John to hold the horse, which young Burroughs proceeded to do, some of the time while lying on a bench. Burroughs, too, complained that he would be absent from his post at a doorway that he was supposed to keep patrons from entering, but Spangler told him he would take the responsibility on himself, which you would automatically say if you were trying to hide your involvement in a nefarious plot? Probably not. Regardless, Booth needed someone to hold his horse while he went inside to shoot the president, and he specifically asked for Edmund Spangler. 
The prosecution also tried to make much of how clear the stage right backstage passageway was. The imputation was that someone must have gone to some length to keep the passageway clear of impediments that might slow Booth down. At least one witness said that Spangler had the responsibility for the passageway, which is something I don't understand because the passageway was stage right and Ned was pushing scenes from stage left, the same side as Lincoln's box. Defense witnesses said that keeping the passageway clear was an imperative so that actors wouldn't be prevented from timely stage entrances. Still, orchestra conductor Billy Withers said that it was abnormally clear, it seemed to him. Withers turned out to be one of those witnesses whose stories became more lurid and less factual as time went on. By the 1880s, he was saying that Tad Lincoln was in the audience. He wasn't. That he, Withers, and Spangler wrestled over the controls for the theater's gas lights, with Ned trying to plunge the building into darkness. That Booth had stabbed him nearly to death, when actually Booth had swung his knife at Withers and only ripped his clothes. That it was mainly on his testimony that the principals of the case were convicted, and that Spangler confessed to him that he was an assassination conspirator, which, if true, Withers forgot to mention at the trial. After Ned was arrested, detectives went to his boarding house and seized his carpet bag, which was found to contain some blank paper, a dirty shirt collar, and a rope 81 feet long. This rope was discussed at some length during the trial. The prosecution, while finding it suspicious, never assigned any nefarious use to it, while witnesses for the defense said Spangler may have used it for crabbing, his favorite pastime. In fact, the prosecution's case against Spangler had numerous holes. The commissioners judging him acknowledged this, yet they still found cause to assign him some guilt. I don't see how they could justify this, so we need to talk more about Edmund Spangler which we will do in episode 20. See you then.